Did you get it? All right. Some of you got that. Some of you will get it later. So, all right. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I will try to have you out of here in time for the food. You're not going anywhere, as Pastor Kyle told me this morning. I have a captive audience. That could be good or bad. If I see you gnawing on your arm, I'll move it along a little quicker. But I got three points for you this morning. Three quick points for you this morning. Um, I'm going to start with this. If I were to ask you what homecoming is, what would you say? What is homecoming to you? What is the purpose of today? Somebody. So I won't move on until you answer. <laughs> Filipino, choir. Filipino choir. Somebody else. What's the purpose of homecoming? Caleb. Family and friends. Family and friends, absolutely. Somebody else. Brother Dave. Absolutely. Anybody else? Cass. Remember the legacy. And that's exactly, she hit the nail on the head. Homecoming can be defined as a tradition of welcoming back former students and members, celebrating an organization's existence. It's a tradition, rather, in many high schools, colleges, and churches. So that's what homecoming's about. And I'm not going to preach about that this morning. <laughs> uh, actually, I want to do something a little different. Okay, there's nothing wrong with celebrating those that have come before. There's nothing wrong with looking back. There's nothing wrong with these things, and actually it's an important thing to do. Scripture talks all the time about re being reminded of these things. But as we gather this morning, I want to go in a different direction. It's a wonderful time to look back. It's a wonderful time to look in the bulletin and see those that have been here, the reason this church is here, etc. But I want to talk about the future of this church. I want to ask a question to you. Where's it going? Where do you see this church in one 5, 10, 15, 20 years. That's the thought this morning. Moving forward. And again, taking nothing away from all of the things we've celebrated this morning. I believe they're wonderful things. I believe all the men that were in that bulletin this morning are great men of God that have done great things for this church. It's left, the last, left a lasting legacy. But if it, we dwell on the past, you're never going to move forward in the future. Amen. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 is mainly where I want to get our text this morning. Philippians 3, 13, and 14. We'll read these and we'll pray. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this morning. And God, as has already been mentioned, I thank you for those that have been here before. I thank you for the men of God that have stood in this pulpit, Lord, that have uh, stood in the pulpit across the way, and Lord, that have sacrificed many things to see that this church continues to move forward. And Father, as we look in your word this morning, and we look at some things that I believe we can all glean from your word, and things that can help each and every one of us, not when it just comes to this church, but even the other churches that are represented here this morning. I pray as always, Lord, that you would guide my tongue. I pray you would hide me behind the cross. I pray, Lord, that you would help me. As is always my goal when I preach, to honor you first and foremost, and Lord, to be a help. I pray, Lord, that you would just be with this message. I pray you would speak to our hearts. Thank you for all the food that's been prepared and all those that have traveled distances to be here and to celebrate this, Lord, and just ask that you'd watch over this message. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. It's Philippians 3, 13, and 14. I'll give you a couple thoughts on verse 13. I like to get into commentaries. If you come to my office, there's a lot of commentaries in there. There's Matthew Henry's old commentaries, some of which I can't even read because I cannot read the old uh, what's, uh, Roman, Roman numerals. Can't do those. I'm just going to be frank with that. Um, so i got to look where I'm at in that. I have uh, McGee, I have Wearsby, Phillips, you name it, it's in there. I have some Spurgeon stuff, I have some different things, but as I was preparing for this thought, you always want to do things in context. I believe that's important when it comes to the Word of God, preaching in context. Because if you don't, that's where false religions pop up, that's where false teachings come from, not being within the context of these things. So I'm going to lay a little bit of groundwork on verse 13 here today, um, and then I want to kind of use that as a jumping point if you'd allow me to. McGee, he kind of tells us this is Paul leaving the past and all his failures behind him, including and not limited to mistakes, and not allowing those things to keep him from moving forward. So it's a thought there. Putting those things are behind. Mistakes, uh, issues, things of that nature. Putting those failures behind you. 
Wiersbe talks about forgetting those things that were behind. But he's not talking about a memory loss or a brain malfunction. He's simply saying not being influenced or affected by those things which are behind. Far too many Christians are shackled with the past. Far too many Christians are afraid to move forward because they're looking backwards. How many have ever tried to run forward looking backwards? How many want to try? <laughs> we could try outside after church, right? It's not very productive. When you're looking behind you and running forward, it doesn't work very well, right? Phillips, and this is his quote exactly. I'm going to read it word for word. The task was quite unfinished indeed, barely begun. Paul decided there was only one thing to do. Begin again as though nothing at all had already been done or accomplished. His new plan was to put the past resolutely behind him and set his, new, his sights on new targets ahead. Again, Paul decided there was only one thing to do. Begin again as though nothing at all had already been accomplished. So again, I ask this question, where do you see this church? Why do I say that? Because if we hold the past and we focus on the past, you're never going to move forward. You know, this church, having been here for a number of years and now having uh, pastored my church for be four years, starting on my fourth year in February, I believe it is, time flies, um, taking nothing away from those things because the history here speaks for itself. Many wonderful things have been accomplished in the past. But what does the past do for us this morning? Outside of reminiscing, outside of remembering these things and, and thinking on these things, I have three things or three ways I believe if I'm going to say sometimes we, because I include this in myself, my church, your church, Pastor Buckley's church, others that are represented here today, that if we do these things, this church will have a bright future. First and foremost is this, you need to be a learning and a studying church. You need to be a learning and a studying church. What do I mean by that? The Bible's very clear. So 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How many believe it's important as a church to learn and to study? I enjoyed Corey's Sunday school this morning. How, where is he at? He's in there somewhere. I'm used to my church. What's that? He's getting chicken. He's excused because we're going to eat chicken later, right? <laughs> he did it a little unique. But you know what? I enjoyed it. Because it was something that we could learn from. I'm like Corey. I visually learn. If you're not a learning church and you're not a studying church, we're going to see some things that can come from it. But I believe there are many things uh, as to, go, to show why this is so very, very important to us. Not only as a church, but as individuals. Think of it this way. If we're not studying, then we're not learning. And if we're not learning, we're not growing. Say it again. If we're not studying, we're not learning. If we're not learning, we're not growing. Listen, if you're not studying the word of God, you're not learning anything. And if you're not learning anything, you're not growing. What is the purpose of God's church? To evangelize, to tell others about Christ, right? To grow, to do these things. And listen, think of it this way. If you're not studying, you are going to be swayed. Ephesians 4.14, the Bible says, Then we henceforth be no more children, rather that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the slight of man and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. How many believe you have an enemy out there that's lying in wait to deceive? I truly and wholeheartedly believe that far too often there are churches not in it for the long haul because they quit studying and they quit learning. How many have arrived this morning? If you have, come talk to me because I want to know how you did it. How many have arrived? Right? None of us have. That's the point of this Christian life. It's a continual Learning process is a continual sanctification process, continuing to learn, continuing to grow. Listen, if you're not learning and studying, you're going to be deceived. You're going to be, you're going to be able to be succumb, and you're going to be able to be deceived by false doctrines. How many have ever heard if we don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything? How many have ever had a scam artist call? Anybody at all? I had a case the other day. Um, I'm back at the sheriff's office. Uh, my, I do that along with pastoring, for those that didn't know. And I had a guy come in, and we were talking about some different things, and um, scammed. So I had some fun with it. I called the scam artist back. Hello. You won Publishers Clearinghouse. Who's this? Oh, this is Deputy Boucher. Who's this? Oh, well, don't call this number. I said, okay, well, don't call this number, right? Scam artist. Listen, just a little FYI. If, publish, if you win Publishers Clearinghouse, they're not going to ask you for money. <laughs> okay? They're going to give it to you. Okay? But think of it, if the scam artists of this world are so good at what they do, how much more is Satan? Think about it. First, uh, someone quote 1 Peter 5, 8 to me. Be sober, be vigilant, because your buddy, is that what it says? That's not what my Bible says. 
Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Who's he want to devour? Every one of you sitting in the pews this morning. You know who he really wants? He wants those little kids downstairs. How many agree with that? Satan wants them more than you would ever imagine. How many parents in here would be willing to do anything for their child? Study. Read, learn, grow. Because if you're not doing it, you're, you're doing a disservice to your children. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn there real quick. i got to have you turn some places. I like to put the verses in my notes because I get a little excited and sometimes I don't turn to places or I forget where they're at. But I don't want to be a ski jump preacher this morning, as some would say. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. As I say that, I can't even get there. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. This is on the thought of learning and studying. Because if as a church you're not doing this, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be susceptible to deception. The Bible tells us in verse 13, For such are false prophets, or false, false apostles rather, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostle of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Think about what the Bible's telling us there. If you're not grounded in the word of God and you're not studying, you're not learning, and you're not growing, you are going to be susceptible to the deception of Satan himself. He appears as a minister of righteousness. It says here, an angel of light. His ministers, I call them his minions. They're out there, they're doing things. How many believe that's true? How many have had some weird things happen to you? So we had first responders Sunday at our church last Sunday. And I was prepping for it, and it was late at night. And uh, I was sitting there in my office, and as you sit in my office, you look out, and there's the parking lot, and to the left is the auditorium. And I'm just going to tell you a story because I think it's cool, and I believe it pertains to this. And I heard, this door handle jingle. Well, I got up, and I was like, okay, that was a little weird. And then the hair on the back of my neck stood up a little bit. So I was like, okay, and I went back to prepping for my sermon, and then I heard a little shuffle, shuffle, shuffle going on in the auditorium. And I thought, oh, boy, here we go. So you know what I did? And I told my church this the other day, and they kind of laughed at me. I was at the printer singing There's Power in the Blood, yelling at the auditorium in the dark, get lost. Why did I do that? Because Satan's real. And you know what happened when that happened? I had a calm come over me. Why? Because there's power in the blood. Listen, if we don't understand this thing, and here's another thought on this, First Peter 2. It says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. And I believe that's an important part. But I believe too many churches are stuck on the bottle. I don't say that ignorantly. I don't say that willy-nilly. I say that to be the truth. Hebrews 5, I'm going to read it. You don't have to turn there. 12 through 14 says, for when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which by the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not strong milk. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of full age, even those who by reason of us have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Churches aren't in it for the long haul because they have too many people in the bottle stage. What does the Bible tell us here in Hebrews? Those, for the time you ought to be teachers, you're still drinking of the milk. Is there anything wrong with drinking the milk of the Word of God? The first principles, understanding the things that we understand as young people, the things that our children learn. Absolutely not. But if your pastor stood up here and he's still sucking on the bottle, is this church going to grow? If with individuals, if we as Christians that have been saved for years and years and years and years are not in the meat of the word of God and standing on a foundation, we are going to fall. This church will not be here in the future if you do not study and learn and teach. Here's a quote. As we grow in the word, we learn to use it in daily life. As we apply the word, we exercise our spiritual senses and develop spiritual discernment. It is a characteristic of little children that they lack discernment. How many parents in here say amen to that? Right? A baby will put anything into its mouth. An immature believer will listen to any preacher on the radio or television and not be able to identify whether or not he is true to the scriptures. How many people no longer go to church or how many churches are no longer here because they are not grounded in the word of God? They don't have spiritual discernment because they're not reading, they're not studying, they're not learning, they're not understanding these things. Listen, how many solid churches do we know today that have drifted away? 
because they're not in this. You know, this has answers to every question you have. This has answers to everything that you could ever imagine is in this book. Why is it so many of us, churches included, don't want to do anything about it? Nothing wrong with looking in the past. Today, that's what it's about. And just being encouraged with all of the things in the past. But if you sit here today, if your pastor sits here today and tomorrow and next Sunday, he says, you know what? This church has had a great past and I'm just going to smooth sail from here. What's going to happen to this place? You're not going to grow. In order to have a church that's around for a long time, this church needs to study and learn daily. Second point I have for you. You need to be a worshiping church. I said that word. <laughs> all right, worship. It's a hot button topic. What are you going to do in heaven? You're going to worship God. Do some people worship a little different than you? Sure. Some people take things this extreme, this extreme? Sure. But the point is this, is that if this church is going to move forward, you need to worship God. Practice now. You know, I honestly believe that we all worship daily. Every one of you in here worships daily, myself included. Why is that? What do I mean by that? Who do you worship? Not a trick question. Every one of us worships. The definition is show reverence and adoration and honor. It's one of the definitions. Some synonyms to pay homage to, to exalt, to glorify, to cherish, to treasure, to esteem, to do all these other things, to idolize. What do we do? If you're not idolizing and worshiping and doing these things of God, you're doing it to something else, are you not? How many of us have done it? I watched the Celtics lose to the Cavs the other day. You know what? I didn't throw anything at the TV. My wife, are you proud of me? <laughs> it's an inside joke. I used to get so frustrated because I enjoy sports. I enjoy, I enjoy the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Somebody help me, Michael. You're thinking along those. The hype. I enjoy beating people at sports. Winning. Competitive. My daughters play soccer, and they wanted to go to the game. We had first responders Sunday last Sunday, and Kenzie wanted to go to the game, and she wanted to win her participation trophy. I said, no, you can get that thing later. I'll just go buy you one at the store. It doesn't even count, right? Boys tried hard. They played football. They didn't win a single game, right? They don't get a trophy. I'll take it and throw it in the trash. No, I'm just kidding, right? What am I saying by that? I used to idolize these things. I used to put that in front of God. We all worship something. If we're not serving and worshiping God, we're serving and worshiping our own flesh. A couple verses for you. Matthew 6, 24, the Bible says, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. How much clearer can it be? You cannot be on the fence with this. You need to serve God in worshiping him. We worship God in, in song this morning. How many agree with that? You sang to your Lord and Savior. You worshiped the Lord. How about this? Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. If you are worshiping yourself, you're making provision for the flesh. If you're not worshiping God. If this church worships everything under the sun but the Lord, you're doing it wrong. And I'm not saying you are. So don't leave this message and say, oh, Brother Boucher is back and he's beating us over the head. That's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to warn you for things that I've seen in my life. For churches that I've seen all across this country go down the tubes because they refuse to do these things. Because they focus on self-glorification. They focus on these things. Me, 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 me. I can promise you in knowing Kyle, as long as I have Pastor Kyle here, that he's not focused on him. He's not focused on himself. He's focused on the Lord and moving forward with these things. Galatians 5, 16, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Why are we to walk in the Spirit? What won't you do if you walk in the Spirit, according to what Scripture is about to tell us? You won't fill the lust of the flesh. You want to be a fleshly Christian? By all means, that's your right. God doesn't want you to be that way. We want to be a church that worships God, or we want to be a church that worships ourselves. Listen, when we're walking in the Spirit and worshiping God, we're able to do as Christ told the woman at the well in John, to worship in spirit and truth. There is a correct way to worship God. You know, and, and far too many people have hijacked that. I'm not even going to go down that road this morning, but it is not a sin to worship God. I don't believe it's a sin to raise your hand to the Lord. Be thankful. Thank God for all that you've done. Listen, you need to be a learning and a studying church. You need to be a worshiping church. Lastly, you need to be an evangelizing church. You know, if you look in the bulletin, and I was looking through it earlier, if I can find it now. 
We look at your mission statement. Open it up real quick if you got it. Look at your mission statement there. This is what it's about. Because there was something in here that caught my eye. If you look at the very last part of that second paragraph there in missions, taking nothing away from all of the things that have done to that point, what does it say? Read it out loud with me. The church, what? Continues to carry out commission at and abroad. That's what you're doing. Hey, you got the third one. You hit the nail on the head. I'm not saying you don't have the other two, but you for sure have the third one. Why? Because you're an evangelizing church. The fact of the matter is this. If the church isn't evangelizing, the church will ultimately die. Brother Dave can tell you if you sit down with him today at lunch and he can tell you with all the churches that he's in throughout this country that there is very, uh, it's very rare to see churches like this full of kids. He's saying true right there. I'm not making it up. Why? A lot of times those churches aren't evangelizing. A lot of times there's people that don't want to come. Listen, with no new people coming in and being added, the church won't survive. This church will not survive without fresh blood, new people, young people, so on and so forth. One of the nicest things and the most interesting thing to me when we moved over to Kalis, unbeknownst to me, outside of preaching there a time or two, was the fact that there is a lot of little people there. There is. There's a lot of kids over there. Um, And one of the things uh, for me as the pastor over there is I try to be that to them too. I try to be the pastor to them, to, to make time for them, to, you know, call them out in the service for good things and encourage them and do these things. We do super church now. We do it once a month. Um, it's our way of giving back to the kids. I enjoy doing super church. I did it one time, and one of the kids was like, that was the best super church ever, pastor. It's probably because Andrea gave him the best dessert ever, right? <laughs> but what is it about? It's about evangelizing. It's about understanding, as we talked before, that Satan wants these little people. He wants to devour them. We know the famous passage, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Christ himself telling us to go and to do these things. Listen, it's our duty and obligation to tell others about the Lord. And if we do that, the church will grow. The church will live. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I don't think any word in the Bible, in fact, I know there's no word in the Bible that was there by accident. I believe there's an important thing for each. Acts 2, verse 37. It says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And we understand what was going on prior to this with the preaching, the day of Pentecost. It said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? It's always a good response when you preach, right? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. But with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And they, rather than they that gladly received his word, were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about three thousand souls." And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continually, daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God, having favor with all the people. Here's where I want to focus. It says, And the Lord added to the church, what? Daily, such as should be saved. You know why churches aren't being added to daily? Because people aren't evangelizing. You know, the Bible says right there that the Lord added to the church daily. I don't think it's a coincidence that the word daily is in there. I think God wants to add to this church daily. I think God wants to to add to my church daily, Pastor Buckley's church daily. Such as should be saved. You see, the Bible says that God came to seek and to save that which was lost. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Scripture is very clear about this. But why is it that we don't do? Listen, daily in his church, this isn't Pastor Kyle's church. This isn't, this isn't Pastor Mike's church over there. Okay, this isn't Pastor Buckle's church. This isn't, it's God's church. Think about that. 
The fact is this, there's nothing that Satan can do to stop this church as a whole from moving forward. We understand that according to Scripture, Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against this church. Satan can try and try and try all he wants. It's not going to happen. But you know what? He can take some of you out of this church. He can take good churches like this and close the door. He can take scandals. I know churches that I know in my hometown that are closed right now because of scandalous things that have happened. And what's it do? It gives a black eye to the name of Christ. You know what? Do what you can. There should absolutely be nothing. Nothing that stops us from serving God. Cassie's here today. Think about it. It's not uplifting Cassie. I love Cassie to death. She's, she's awesome. But she's here today. How many of us would be like, nope. I skipped church a couple months ago. I had a kidney stone. I don't think my church wanted me preaching on morphine. Right? Uh, I was in the hospital all that morning, and it was probably a good thing. Right? Bless my wife's heart. She was up for like two days. Well, I missed church for that. That was legitimate, okay? Because ask my wife and the nurses. I apologize as soon as they push that stuff because I have no idea what's coming out of my mouth. But you know what? So many of us, we just don't go to church. We're too busy. We don't want to go to church. I'm trying to go to the Patriots-Dolphins game, and I already have it worked out in my head not to miss church. My brother-in-law's church is 40 minutes from Foxborough. So I figured if we can get out of church here, it's a 1 o'clock start. I can get there. I won't have to deal with the tailgaters. I can get right in, watch the Dolphins beat the Patriots. Amen. And then I can go back to Jared's church and be there for the 6 o'clock service. It's in my head. I'm going to do it. I refuse to miss church for something like that. What are we going to miss church for? You Far too many of us miss church for things. And you know what? Satan, you get an attaboy from Satan every time you do that. You can't take your salvation. If you're saved here today, you're bought by the blood of Christ, there's nothing that he can do to take it. You can't even give it back. But you know what? He can decide to make you think that there's more important things to do than tell others about Christ. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, and we'll close with this thought. Matthew chapter 5. I was going to do your pastor Saul and preach for two hours, but I didn't have too many notes here. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 13. If you get the red letter edition, you notice it's in red. Words of our Lord and Savior. It's important to, to understand what he's telling. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth, thenceforth rather good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of man. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that you, they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Why do I go to that passage? Because just as I challenge my church, just as I challenge my church with these things, I challenge you that you are a church on a hill. And you literally are on a hill. So you got really no excuses, right? You're supposed to be a light. How many of us light something and then hide it? I don't make a lick of sense, does it? The Bible's very clear here, Christ himself, that you're on a candlestick in the light. Let your light so shine before men. You as a church will move forward. Your light will shine before men. Listen, I think that the good works that we've talked about this morning from all the pastors of old, that glorifies God. I honestly believe that. That men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This church is here glorifying God because of the works of the men before. And works is important. Don't think for one second, oh, it's faith and faith alone. No, I understand what that means. But I also mean that your good works, your serving the Lord, your being a learning and a studying church, you being a worshiping church, you being an evangelizing church, those are works. You work to learn, you work to study, you work to worship, you work to evangelize. And because of all of that, the culmination of all of that is you're a city and you're a church on a hill and God is going to use this right. moving forward. Think about it. And I'll close with this thought. The choice is yours. It's not mine. I'm no longer a part of here. I'm a sister church. I pray for you guys. 
Pastor Kyle and Michelle and Lucy and Theo are on my prayer list. Every morning they get prayed for. This church gets prayed for. But my question to you is this. Thinking of all the things in the past and praising God for them, where is this church going? Are you moving forward? Or are you going to do and turn and just dwell on the past? And there's nothing wrong with using the past as motivation. I have no doubt in my mind that Pastor Kyle intends to be in here forever. That's his heart. Ask him, he'll tell you. He's probably already told you. You know, I know when he contemplated coming, he called me and asked questions and some different things, and we had good, candid conversation with some things, and it's been a blessing, you know. Um, so be that church that moves forward. Be a blessing to this community. Be a blessing to your pastor. Be a blessing to those that have been here before. And thank God that this church is still here. I mean, it was an honor and a privilege to be asked to come back here and preach. I pray that it was a blessing to you. I know Michael's a little disappointed I didn't get David and Goliath in there, but he comes to mind sometimes, so I'll make sure next time I know it's a holiday weekend that I'll get David ready for him. Um, but I pray it was a blessing to you. I pray it was an encouragement to you. Please don't leave here and say, Pastor Boucher is beating us on the head and telling us we're X, Y, Z. I'm not. Because I believe that you are a church that does these things. But do them better. I could be better about it. Think about it. You don't want to be swayed with these winds of doctrine. How many good men and good women are no longer standing by the stuff because they've allowed themselves? How does it happen? Because they take for granted these things. Study the word of God to show yourself approved, the workman that need not be ashamed. Listen, we all want to get to heaven and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We don't want to be ashamed when we get before God. Then study his word while we're here. That's what I have for you this morning. I'll turn it over to Brother, or Pastor Kyle. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Boucher. I was thinking while he was preaching of what our Lord said. He said this. He said, to whom much is given, much is required. You pull out that bulletin and you look at all that's been given over the years, right? Not just in the pastors, but I think of all the wonderful men and women of God who have sat in this sanctuary and in that sanctuary and they gave and they gave and they gave. Some of you were driven to church by people and, you know, we were sitting in a building that was paid for by other people and they gave. And then one day we're going to be asked, what did you do with it? Remember the men with the talents and the man who had ten, he said, I've got ten more. The man who had five said, I got five more. And then the man who had one said, I buried it in the dirt. He didn't do anything with it. Much will be required of our church because we have a rich heritage. We have so much that's been given to us. And just like Pastor Boucher said, it does us no good just to sit here and say, man, I'm so thankful for everything that's come before. We have to say, I'm thankful for what came before, and now I'm going to move forward. And I'm going to continue on. I'm going to carry on with the, with the faith that has been passed down to me. And I hope that's your heart. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. And just consider this. This would be a good time just to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything that's come before. Thank you for, for those who've impacted me. Thank you that someone led me to the Lord, that you were baptized, that you were taught the word of God by someone. Praise the Lord for that. And then ask yourself this question, what are you doing with it now? Are you continuing? Are you learning? Are you studying? Are you growing? Are you worshiping? Are you evangelizing? And there's not an area that he mentioned that any of us are perfect in. There's always room for improvement, always room for growth. We're going to have a time to respond to the sermon today. Um, let's stand together. We're going to sing a song together. We're just going to sing an a cappella. And if the Lord spoke to your heart, if there's something you want to do business with the Lord about, you can come forward and pray at this altar. We're going to sing hymn number 515, Near the Cross. I appreciate that, Pastor Boucher. I think that's a wonderful thought for today. 515 near the cross. Let's sing together, Brother Denver. I'm going to throw a curveball for you. Let's sing, let's sing a, a song that you will know as well. I have decided to follow Jesus. 826, if you don't know it in your hymn books, there's a couple words different in this hymn book. It says, though no one join me, still I will follow. I have decided. <laughs> 